Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we recognize what a unique time this is in the world right now, and we thank you for joining us for our Future of Blood Cancer Treatments webinar. My name is Jeff Walker, and I'm a Senior Director of Philanthropy at the Swedish Medical Center Foundation. The foundation is the fundraising arm of the Swedish Medical Center. We being the largest nonprofit healthcare system in Washington State and based in Seattle. I would like to take this opportunity to first thank our donors who are joining us today, along with everyone else. Without your support, we would not be able to continue the innovative work that we do every day for our patients. So very sincerely, thank you. Uh, we will be recording today's event and this will be uploaded to our foundation website in the coming days, as well as being emailed to everyone who is registered for this event. Regarding how our time together will proceed, I will be asking questions to the panelists, but this event is meant to be informative and interactive. So please enter your own questions in the Q&A. We will answer your questions throughout the call and also at the end. Um, also, there is an option when entering your questions into the Q&A to mark them anonymous if you prefer. So today we will be talking with two experts at the Swedish Cancer Institute's Center for Blood Disorders and Stem Cell Transplantation. The center focuses on treating all blood-related disorder diseases. Our team of renowned specialists offers cutting edge therapies, including novel immunotherapies and stem cell transplantation, while providing access to a wide range of clinical trials. The center is, an act, is active in the Institute's personalized medicine program, using gene sequencing of the patient's unique tumor to understand which treatment would be best for each individual patient. I would now like to introduce our experts for this webinar. And we'll pause a moment while their cameras turn on. Okay, I think we are there, good. Um, and starting with Dr. Krish Patel, Director of the Lymphoma Program, and Tenzin Somo, Supervisor of the Hematology Oncology Research Program, both at the Swedish Cancer Institute's Center for Blood Disorders and Stem Cell Transplantation. So I'd like to start off by asking our experts to tell us a bit about yourselves, your journey, and uh, current practice setting. Uh, Dr. Patel, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for the kind of introduction and certainly my pleasure to be uh, with you all today. Uh, my name, as Jeff mentioned, is Krish Patel. I'm the director of the lymphoma program at the Swedish Cancer Institute. Um, I came to Seattle about five and a half years ago. Um, I had previously been at Duke University uh, where I'd spent 15 years um, and did my medical school and postgraduate training. Um, my uh, interests here in Swedish are really centered around uh, clinical research that helps us to develop new therapies for patients with blood cancers, um, and in particular those um, uh, who have uh, lymphomas. And as a uh, clinician who specializes in lymphomas, I also um, am a uh, cell therapy and uh, transplant physician. So uh, have expertise in using those uh, treatments to treat our patients. And that's also a major uh, focus of my uh, clinical research efforts. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Patel. And Tenzin, um, I'd love, we'd love to hear more about you. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tenzin Somo. Um, I'm, I supervise the uh, hematology oncology research team here at SCI. Uh, working closely with Dr. Patel and Dr. Benzinger and a few of the other doctors. Um, I actually joined, I think, a couple of months right after Dr. Patel here. So we, we, pretty, we pretty much started here at the same time. Uh, I've been in clinical research for uh, almost 15 years and uh, five of those spent uh, here at SCI. Um, and my why for why I do what I do is, um, you know, I've been on the other, other side of the curtain, um, you know, being a, a caretaker for my mom. And uh, I wish I knew what I know now then to kind of help her through that process. And uh, I hope to bring that experience with me and, and helping patients, um, you know, bring a positive change and uh, make treatment options available to uh, those who have exhausted all other avenues. That's fantastic. Thanks, Tenzin. Thanks for telling us a bit about kind of your, your personal why, your personal motivation, if you will. 
Um, you've anticipated one of my next questions. I'm still going to ask it. Uh, we'll let Dr. Patel go first uh, in, in case it adds to your, your thoughts, Tenzin. Um, but as I think about this, I mean, the field of medicine is so broad, um, as is the world of cancer. What led each of you to specialize in blood disorders? Yeah, so I think, Jeff, it's a, a really um, important um, question to ask ourselves why we do what we do. And, and uh, you know, I can think of a couple different reasons that led me to uh, become a specialist in blood cancers. I think the first is that, um, you know, from the scientific perspective, um, there is a lot that is unique about blood cancers and a lot that lends itself well to um, study and rapid uh, kind of translation from um, the, the lab to the clinic. And so that's something I had an opportunity early in my career to do. Um, I did a research fellowship at the uh, NCI, the National Cancer Institute at the NIH, and worked in a basic science laboratory in a cancer biology lab. And so that was very formative for me. Mm -hmm. And then as I went through my clinical training, um, you know, I think a lot of times for many of us, it's about kind of where you feel a fit. And, um, you know, my mentors um, primarily were blood cancer specialists and their approach to uh, treating patients, uh, how they uh, valued science, how they married the human aspect of medicine uh, with the science really resonated with me. And um, I think it's also important to note that um, not all, but many blood cancers are potentially curable. Um, mm -hmm. That was a very uh, appealing aspect of caring for patients that might be very ill is to offer them the potential that we might actually completely eradicate their disease. They might have a return to life without a cancer. Uh, that's not true for all blood cancers, but it is true for some and, and certainly a, a, a very unique aspect of, of caring for patients with blood cancers. Fantastic. Thank you. I love when there's a, a, a vision uh, for hope there and you really uh, circled around that, which is fantastic. Um, Tenzin, I'll ask you the same question, um, and I can repeat it if you need. Um, and, but I'm also going to note that I, I saw you nodding when Dr. Patel referenced, uh, sometimes there's just a good fit. Um, so I suspect you have something to say about that. <laughs> Absolutely, Jeff. Um, you know, I mean, when I started here at SCI, my world could have gone either way, um, kind of, you know, the, the hematologic pathway versus the solid tumor pathway. And I, I thankfully fit it right here in the, uh, the heme group. And, uh, you know, I've been working with uh, the, the, the 10th floor, which is the hematologic malignancy group up there closely. Um, and, you know, I, I echo what Dr. Patel mentioned that sometimes it's a good fit. The pace is right. Um, and the science in itself is exciting. So that, that's what kind of drives me to be here. And, it is really just, you know, this constant learning about what's going on. And obviously, you know, cancer therapy is changing. And with that, it's, it's almost like you're always in school trying to catch up with it. And, you know, that's, that's the exciting part. Um, and not only that, you know, there's the science behind it, but we're also seeing actual results um, in uh, helping patients. So that's kind of the other side that's exciting. And that kind of brings me to, you know, want to come to work every day. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You said two things that really jumped out at me. One of them was uh, the pace feels right or the pace is right. From what I know about this, this your group, um, it's a pretty high pace there and there's a lot going on. Um, so good on you for, for you know, really wanting to be up for running with that. Um, and then again, uh, intentionally or not, you, you set me up for my next question. Um, and that is um, kind of, you know, it's a combination of what makes the center so special. Well, let's start there. Um, Dr. Patel, I'd love to ask you to tell us a bit about what makes the Center for Blood Disorders so special. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I could, I could say a couple of things, Jeff, but to me, really, um, the first, first and foremost, it's about the people. Uh, I think the people that we have here are really um, uniquely aligned in our uh, goal for patients, which is really to deliver the best treatments um, of, that we have of today while also trying to integrate the treatments of tomorrow. And so research and, and clinical care are really uh, extremely well integrated in our, um, in our center. And that for me is, is probably our greatest strength is that uh, we are able to deliver um, you know, really cutting edge treatments in outside of a university-based health system, which is quite unique. And um, that mission is uh, really well aligned. And so 
you know, all my patients that I see have access to treatments that are only available in, in handfuls of centers around the country and, and quite honestly around the world. And, and I think that that is really unique, but we're able to deliver that care with, I think, a very personal touch. And that speaks to um, the personalities and the fit and the people who, who really make the program very special. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, you're making my job as a moderator so easy because you're giving me so much to work with. Um, I'm going to tie a couple things together that you said, Dr. Patel, uh, and that is um, when you think about leukemia and lymphoma treatment, um, there's a sort of a look back and there's certainly a look ahead here, which you just spoke to. Putting it possibly over simply um, oversimplified, what's better now in those treatments than was the case five or even 10 years ago? Yeah, so even five years ago when I joined the program, you know, most care for patients with blood cancers involved kind of chemotherapy-based care. That was still our main tool to use. Um, kind of fast forward now five years later, and that's really been completely upended. Um, many blood cancers, not all, but many are, are primarily treated with um, targeted therapies or immune therapies and very little chemotherapy. A great example of that is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, a disease that uh, very rarely do we ever use chemotherapy anymore. Um, and so, you know, things, as you mentioned, have really been um, growing, or really research has, has developed uh, new therapies um, at a breakneck pace in blood cancers, and that is really being translated across different cancers. So across leukemias, lymphomas, multiple myeloma, we see the same type of uh, change in treatment paradigm. And what's really, I think, very exciting um, in our program is we get to see that before um, really many other centers around the, the world because we're involved in the development of these treatments. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I, I can tell, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a question that's uh, slightly off of where we've been, but you've, you've touched on it twice and I can't resist. Um, your reference to the fact that Swedish and the Swedish Cancer Institute are not, is a non-academic institution. Um, and the uniqueness of us functioning like that, where so many others are the case. Can you say a bit more about that and what makes us so special in that regard? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we're doing clinical research trials and um, essentially assessing new treatments um, in patients, um, those types of trials are, are very um, uh, complicated and complex. They span from uh, the very first time that a patient or a human being receives a medicine to uh, trials where medicines that have been studied in uh, preceding trials are now being tested against standard therapies. And we do all of these types of trials. In particular, in the blood cancer program, about half of our pr uh, clinical trials are what we would call phase one or first in human trials. So the very first patients in the world who might be receiving certain therapies are getting those. Um, phase one clinical research has changed a lot over the last few decades, where it used to be that those trials were primarily designed to look for any side effects or to assess if a medicine is safe to give patients. Now they're quite different, where in many phase one trials, we can expect patients to actually benefit from the treatment. They may have some very meaningful response to treatment, and that's become more and more commonplace. So these types of trials are often in very select places, and we have access to many of these. And, and you know, quite proudly, I will say that in the last five years, we've been involved uh, from the earliest stages of development of some medicines that are now FDA approved for treatment of blood cancers. So our patients who might have enrolled in those trials many years ago mm -hmm. were really amongst the, the, the first uh, to be uh, treated with such medicines. That's really exciting. And that's so fantastic to hear. Um, makes me feel all the better about working here at Swedish. Uh, Tenzin, I would love to hear uh, some very similar question from you, really, as it relates to multiple myeloma. Um, and looking ahead, where do you see multiple myeloma treatments going in the next five to 10 years? So very similar to what Dr. Patel has mentioned, you know, the landscape of cancer therapy is constantly changing. We're always trying to keep up with it. Um, you know, uh, knowing what I know now, immunotherapies are really the way to go, in, uh, targeted immunotherapies, because in these immunotherapies, what we're basically doing is we're 
utilizing our own body's um, immune system to hone in on a target. And the hope behind it is, you know, unlike the cytotoxic chemotherapies that used to be given to patients historically, um, you know, we're, we're trying to hone in on just one target so that you don't have a lot of collateral damage, um, you know, when it comes to patients' um, daily life. You know, we want people to get benefit from these therapies, but at the same time maintain a, a, a good life that they're not, you know, bedridden or they're not constantly spending time in a hospital. Uh, we want them to live their life. And, um, you know, that, that's what kind of what immunotherapy does is it, it's just a hone target that really focuses on attacking just the cancer cells and have as, you know, less uh, collateral damages in attacking healthy cells. Um, and just like what Dr. Patel has mentioned, you know, it's, it's what we knew then versus what we know now is very different and the landscape is changing. And the best thing I can really think about it is, you know, Maya Angelou once said, you know, do the best you can. And when you know better then do better. And that, that pretty much kind of resonates with this because it is really that with the cancer therapy, especially in hematologic oncology. Fantastic. Um, uh, you know, and I can't help thinking, I mean, I, I, what was it, probably seven years ago was probably the first time I remember hearing the phrase immunotherapies. And, you know, I don't know how close I am on that. Maybe I wasn't paying attention to the news, but it's a relatively new area that, like you said, is ramping up really fast. All right. Um, you said something else that, that caught my attention. I'm going to really show some of my ignorance here, but I, I can't resist. Um, when I do pay attention to the news and the, the, the readings to some degree, I hear reference of a um, bispecific monoclonal antibody. Um, is that an immunotherapy? I think there's a lot of questions about what is an immunotherapy? And I'm, I'm picking one that I just have happened to have heard. Yeah. So um, I think Tenzin gave a, a great introduction to immunotherapies. Um, and, and Jeff, what, what we call an immunotherapy is changing every day too. So um, bispecific antibodies are a type of immune therapy. And I think the key um, point that Tenzin raised is we're using medicines to try to uh, redirect our own immune system to attack cancer. And we can do that in a multitude of ways. We can give patients uh, medicines that kind of enhance their own immune system. Um, we can take immune cells out of the body and modify them in a laboratory and give back those treatments to patients. That uh, An example of that is CAR T-cell therapy or what we call cellular therapies. Um, or we can even use medications that might be given by mouth that have properties that kind of uh, shift or alter the balance of the immune response. And so um, what ultimately is now labeled immunotherapy is getting broader and broader all the time. <clears throat> and what you mentioned by specific antibodies are one of the um, newer tools in the immunotherapy toolkit um, that might um, you know, ultimately allow us to, uh, to have enough tools that we can apply them in uh, many different patient types. So as you might imagine, all of these treatments might have a better fit for uh, certain patients or certain diseases. And the goal is to have really something for everybody. Fantastic. That really paints the broad picture um, that I think is so important for uh, at least lay people like me to hear and understand because it is a phrase that's thrown around a lot more. And um, we may think we know what it is. Um, I know I was not accurate in my understanding. So, um, it's, you know, it's great to get that full picture there. Whenever something is new um, and even beyond the new stage, there are barriers to um, going to the next level, to the next step. I can't help wondering what are some of the barriers uh, to some of these new treatments, you know, whether that's specifically immunotherapies, again, broadly, um, or something else that you've talked about so far. And, and either one of you can answer. Um, I guess mm -hmm. I should have picked somebody. So I can I can touch base a little on that, Jeff. You know, I mean, um, more research, right? Uh, the more we do research, the more we get answers. But with those answers, all also comes questions that we want to raise further. So more research is, you know, always better. I think in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, also, the re research in itself, you know, running a trial is costly. Um, these trials are closely monitored by the FDA for you know, to ensure safety, um, you know, the more the no more novel the drug is, the more it is scrutinized, of course, for another good reason, that safety is paramount. 
Um, with that comes a lot of resources for staffing and um, you know a lot of other like laboratory needs. But mostly it is it is really staffing just because we need a lot of bodies to um, be able to kind of collect the data and give the patients what they need in terms of all the information related to the the, the drug therapy that they're involved in. And it's it's just the personal resource is extremely important, I believe. Um, you know, this barrier is also not just one sided. I mean, that's kind of the clinician side of running a clinical trial, but we also want to think about the patient side as well, that you know, not every patient, well, I should say a lot of patients don't have access to, you know, world-class therapies that we're able to bring to the doorstep here in the Pacific Northwest. We have patients traveling from Hawaii, um, Montana, Alaska, as far as Miami to just, you know, um, just to be here to participate in one of our clinical trials. And those patients need lodging, traveling. And the last thing you want to do is to kind of just think about all of those resources when you're getting a diagnosis of, you know, whether it is leukemia, lymphoma, or myeloma. So um, that is also another kind of uh, side of the therapy that we, we want to really bring attention to that, you know, these, these are sick patients and we want to, um, we don't want them to think about the lodging and the traveling and all of these other ancillary things to be a, a priority when they should be really focusing on treatment. So that's another unmet need when it comes to resources and um, sort of the barriers of running a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. That's such an important point. We all, it's too easy to think about having an image of research happening, and I'm being a little silly when I say this, but needing funding to put, you know, to, to get that new microscope um, or, or genetic sequencing equipment. Yes, that's critical. Um, but you hit a really important point about the, the patient side of that, uh, because I do know that folks come from far beyond this region uh, for, for treatments here, and they have to be within a certain proximity of the Institute to be in a clinical trial. Um, I do have a follow-up question to that, but Dr. Patel, I wanted to pause in case you had a response there too. Sure. I mean, I, I think Tenzin highlighted it really well. I'll say, you know, when we're doing, um, if we imagine the earliest stage of clinical trials, these phase one trials, first in human studies, it might take five to seven to eight years from that initial trial to a potential FDA approval for a therapy. And so when we think about the unmet needs um, in uh, research, um, you know, speed is one of them. And so being able to open trials quickly, being able to have the staff and the resources and the expertise, all the kind of personnel resources Tenzin mentioned uh, to open those trials quickly, to be able to enroll them quickly. So to be able to bring in patients um, who really would potentially benefit from those therapies and accrue those trials rapidly, ultimately gives a, gets us faster to the knowledge we wanna to have to take the next incremental step. So I think Tenzin highlighted it really well. It's, it, it's skilled personnel. It's um, breaking down the barriers to allow patients who might benefit from these trials to get to the centers that have these trials and enroll in them. And then you know, Tenzin brought up a really important point, which is that with every answer we get from a study, usually we have two or three more questions. So these, this is the area where you know, we might be working in collaboration with pharmaceutical companies and other research centers to work on trials, but a lot of times there are going to be smaller kind of side um, projects that spin out of these clinical trials that we want to be able to have funding to support. So if there's an interesting question we need to answer, that can be taken on by, you know, one of the centers that's collaborating in the trials and not necessarily, um, it, that may not necessarily be answered by uh, the pharmaceutical companies that are, you know, often running these trials. So funding to support those kinds of important uh, research questions that that arise while we're doing the studies are, are are extremely important as well. Fantastic, thank you. I wrote down what you said. Um, it's kind of the thread that goes through so much of what's being talked about. It gets us by, you know, speeding up the ability to open up clinical trials. It gets us to the knowledge faster. I love that because it's that knowledge that feeds into the treatments down the road. Um, well put. Um, my my follow-up question, it's intended for Tenzin. Um, I'll ask it, but Dr. Patel, of course, if you have thoughts around it, we'd love to hear them. So I, I'm thinking about an individual patient. Um, and if a patient is curious about clinical trials, what's your advice? 
my advice for those patients, well, speaking to your doctor first and foremost about what treatment trial options are available, um, more than likely your primary oncologist, whether you're in this area or somewhere else, um, is aware of another center where they're working with somebody who is uh, who has availability for these clinical trials. Um, so, you know, reaching out to your doctor and asking them questions about what treatment options they are. You know, there are a lot of options available right now as a standard of care, but what more could you do? What more can you provide me? And honestly, just being, uh, being your own advocate for, uh, you know, for your treatment. And I feel like Asking more questions, uh, clinicaltrials.gov is a great uh, website where all the clinical trials and its participating um, sites are listed on that website. Um, and you know, the more you know about treatment options that are out there, I feel like more you're empowered in your own treatment. And so the, that first step is really asking questions and just kind of getting to know uh, and keeping up with research because they're 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 almost always something going on that is uh, not uh, standardized right now, but could be a treatment option available. Um, and, you know, doing your own research, obviously carefully, because it's the internet, but, you know, collaborating with your doctor and um, asking questions is, uh, I think, extremely important. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Dr. Patel, did you have yeah, just to add to that, I think a lot of times, Jeff, there is a, a bit of a perception that a trial might only be appropriate for a patient that has kind of gone through all uh, mm -hmm. existing standard therapies, um, but that is certainly not the case. I mean, I think it's important when patients are being treated, even if it's the very first treatment they receive, to ask about trials, because what many trials try to do is improve upon a standard therapy. So we might have standard therapies, but that may not mean that they're really the ideal treatment. That could be that they're, um, even though they're the best of what we have proven, that they leave a lot uh, of room for improvement um, in terms of how well the therapy works or the side effect profile. So clinical trials can really be found at every stage of treatment. And I think that's an important concept for people to know as they're thinking about what it means to be in a trial. Um, and our goal is to really have trials at every level or every stage of a patient's illness um, from the very beginning to you know, later lines of therapy. And so uh, that's probably the most important advice I could give a patient is that they are really um, potentially impactful at any time that someone needs therapy, not only when uh, people have gone through, um, you know, a, a number of standardly available therapies. Great. That's such an important point because you're right. I think that's what we so often hear is um, after going through more standard treatments, you know, this is, this is, let's give this a try. But so often I think it's, and you really said this more often the case earlier and earlier in that timeline as, as um, these therapies become, um, you know, more proven, if you will that they really are applicable earlier on. Uh, Dr. Patel, I'm gonna ask you a question that plays off of something that Tenzin said earlier, and I'm, and I'm posing it to you because you are a, you are a physician, you are a clinician. Um, I've heard folks say in conversations over time that they feel intimidated or uneasy to act their, ask their physician about clinical trials um, and putting them on something. Uh, if it's something that the physician here, you know, he himself or herself didn't already suggest. Um, what advice would you give to patients who might have that hesitancy? Yeah, I, I think the first thing to, to um, say is like Tenzin really said well is, you know, we want patients to feel empowered, right? So asking about a trial is, is to me not different than asking about two standard therapies that might be available, right? You want to make an informed decision about um, what the benefits of a a potential therapy are, whether it's in a trial or not, and what the risks are. And so the, that, that would be my advice is to really um, empower patients to feel like, okay, I really just want to understand what are all of my options, right? Great. I love it. Being a partner in their own care. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Patel, uh, since you were just speaking, I'm going to continue the flow here. Um, how does the Center for Blood Disorders research fit into the broader landscape of blood cancers research? You've spoken to this to some degree, but um, I'm, I'm guessing there's, there's another layer of that. Yeah, so um, the first thing to say is, um, you know, the community of blood cancer specialists is small. <laughs> so 
Um, you know, we are interconnected with our colleagues who are uh, also, um, you know, attempting to uh, improve on our therapies around the country, but also around the globe. So uh, we work on these clinical trials in collaboration with other centers. In that regard, it's often true that um, centers that are doing um, earlier stage research tend to have um, um, a more uh, kind of specialized um, portfolio of trials. And that might mean that um, the experiences that we have are more specialized, or perhaps that the types of patients we see um, are um, really enriched for you know, uh, those early stage clinical trials. And so I think what makes um, the Center for Blood Disorders Research really fit is that we're integrated really across that spectrum. Um, we have clinical trials here that might only be open in five or six centers in the world. We have clinical trials that might be open in a hundred different sites around the world. And so we really do all levels of research. And the goal is for us to not only learn from our own experience, but to learn from those of our colleagues and to learn in parallel and, and be collaborative and really be plugged into you know, what's going on globally at the leading edge of, of um, blood cancer research. So I think all of that means that, you know, we have really everything under the sun uh, that a patient with blood cancers might um, want to, to have, and we have access to all those resources. And, um, you know, that, that I think is really important. We're extremely plugged into the community of researchers in uh, blood cancers. Fantastic. Thank you. One of the questions that I am asked a lot, it's possibly up there in the top five, if you will, is does Swedish, Swedish Cancer Institute um, collaborate with other institutions locally or far away? I heard a resounding yes from you there. Um, and, you know, it's, I kind of want to dig into it, but I don't want to take us too far off course. Um, so, you know, how do, how do those collaborations happen? I would at least be curious of the starting place for those. Yeah, so they can happen in a number of ways. So, for example, when we're working on an early uh, phase clinical trial that might be um, sponsored by a pharmaceutical industry, there are going to be other centers that are partnered in that trial. So, for example, phase one clinical trials may include, you know, somewhere between five to ten sites around the US or around the world that are each enrolling patients together um, to uh, accomplish the goals of the trial. So that's one way in which we collaborate and connect. Those trials often have very frequent um, uh, safety discussions or meetings between all the collaborators to make sure we're all learning from each other's experience. So that's one way. A second way is that really independently, um, we may have clinical questions that require research efforts to answer that we want to grow and develop ourselves. So we may create and design our own clinical trials. And in doing so, we may find um, that our colleagues around uh, the country or around the world want to participate in answering that effort. We may need to do that kind of collaborative work to get enough data to answer those questions. And so um, that comes from those um, uh, desires and connections that we foster and have. And so they happen in a lot of ways. And, and then the other I would say is, you know, we're in a town where we have a lot of um, uh, biotech startups and um, companies that are looking to solve problems that might exist in um, cancer care. And so often we are approached by those folks to really at an early point in time, help kind of shape um, research questions and help to develop um, studies that may answer important questions. So it happens in a number of ways. That's fantastic. Thanks for painting that full picture. Um, I, my guess would be that folks who are tuned in right now are love to hear those answers um, because it really is one of the top questions that I get as I'm out meeting folks. Um, that indeed the physicians, the researchers um, at the various institutions, nonprofit and you know, for-profit biotechs, if you will, um, are all working together for the good of the patient. So thanks for sharing. Um, Tenzin, I did have a question for you, but I also want to pause in case you had anything to say about that last question, because I think there was a lot packed in there. Not requiring it, though. <laughs> That's okay, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, you know, what Dr. Patel has mentioned, the pace of research is frustrating. Sometimes it, it, it might feel like it is going extremely slow. 
Um, but you know, first and foremost, uh, the the rule is do no harm. And uh, secondly, you know, this methodical rigorous um, process is the best way to ensure that we're getting conclusive information and data on safety and efficacy. And the only way to do it is really just to put it put in time and uh, put in the effort. So sometimes it may feel like it's taking a really long time, but um, it is all uh, so we can make sure that it is a safe safe drug that's getting out there. Great, thank you. I appreciate that, um, Tenzin. So I would love to ask you, and again, if if uh, Dr. Patel, if you have something to add, um, do feel free. But we'd love to hear clinical trial success stories, um, and I would wonder if you have any or one to share. Those are my favorite, actually. So yes, absolutely. Um, so I guess, you know, one patient that I can just kind of share a story about is, is a patient that was uh, you know, diagnosed with multiple myeloma many, many, many years ago. And um, she was kind of at the ends of, um, you know, treatment options. And um, she actually had signed up for Death with Dignity and got approved. Um, and, you know, the, the whole idea behind Death with Dignity is just kind of ending your life um, at, in, on your own term. Um, but, you know, right before... Um, she had made the final decision. Uh, there was a trial that became available. It was a combination immunotherapy trial. And uh, we, um, you know, she agreed to participate in this trial. And within one month, I believe her tumor burden decreased by 90%. And uh, I mean, it was pretty remarkable. Like, with, you know, we did not expect it at all, but it, you know, she lived a very, very nice life for the next four years. And she was able to do a lot of activities and, um, you know, get a lot of things off of her bucket list. She went to the Caribbean and went on cruises, took dance lessons. So, um, so I would say that's that's one of uh, the great success stories that I can remember. Um, just you know, and this is what research really means: is when you feel like you're at the end of you know everything. Hopefully, we're able to give you some hope and just you know present with a treatment option um, that could be it. Um, so, I. That's probably one of the, the sweet stories I can remember from me being here for the past five years. That's great. Thank you. I feel like I should have uh, you know, warned folks to have a tissue at the ready before I asked that question. Um, and I have this vision of you know, almost a, a mathematical equation, research equals hope. Um, that really says a lot. Uh, Dr. Patel, is it fair to ask you a sim that same question? Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'll say, Jeff, I've been very fortunate to be involved in studies where <clears throat> our patients have clearly benefited. And, and um, in many respects, I'd say that there are many of those stories to share. Um, I can share one in particular that I think um, is really uh, still very, um, you know, it, it makes me extremely happy every time I think about it. Um, you know, we, we had a patient that had had uh, many lines of therapy for a very aggressive lymphoma. Um, about six or seven different treatments. Um, and um, some of those treatments were clinical research treatments, some were not. And that patient really would not have been expected to survive um, that disease and was a young patient. And, um, you know, as often as the case with clinical trials, some research therapies work enough to get us to the next um, treatment. They may not have completely accomplished our kind of, um, you know, dreamed of goal of getting rid of the cancer entirely, but that incremental progress allowed us in the case of this patient to get to one that really did. And um, that sequencing of tools to get to that point is something that we were only able to do because we had a multitude of clinical trials to offer that patient. And so I think about that impact because it's not only the success story of one therapy that got that patient into a remission that has been maintained now for quite a long time, but also one of the partial successes of some of our therapies. Sometimes that is the nature of oncology where our treatments give us some success, but not everything we wanted out of it. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, I remember, I think it was just pre-pandemic, but there was an article um, in the, well, one of the bus local business magazines, stating that Swedish uh, was the leader of clinical trials in the region at that time, highest number of open clinical trials of any institution in the Seattle area. 
Um, and it's important to note that that is Swedish, but the Cancer Institute is absolutely the leader uh, within Swedish. So uh, that really ties together a lot of what you just said. Um, Dr. Patel, I, I believe I re recall hearing that the Center for Blood Disorders uh, conducted a first in humans clinical trial. I think it was last year. Um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so, so we do a number of different uh, first-in-human studies. So phase one trials might be the first study where a patient uh, um, receives a medicine. And often, as I mentioned, Jeff, there's a small number of centers involved in those. So on occasion, we've been the very first center in the world to open a trial and then to uh, treat and dose a patient. And we've done that actually a few times in the five years I've been here in fact, the first study that Tenzin and I worked on together, we were the first center in the world to give that medicine to patients. We've since been the leading center in the world to treat patients with that particular medicine. And so um, we have a number of examples of this across the different blood cancer programs. Uh, being able to open a trial quickly often is what enables us to be able to be amongst the first centers in the world to give a medicine uh, to a, a real person for the first time ever. And so um, sometimes we're able to do that. Sometimes we're in um, a little bit later in the group of, of centers that are opening. Great. Thank you. That really says a lot about um, Swedish and your, your team there at the Center for Blood Disorders overall. Um, you actually, uh, I don't even, don't even think I have to ask this question. Um, I'll, I'll put it out there, but feel free to just give a thumbs up if you've already answered it, because I think you have. But as you were talking early on, I was thinking, um, if, if we look at something like that, how has it impacted other patients' treatments? What I heard you say is that you were able to use the learnings, not just from that trial that I had in my mind, but other trials, um, to really apply those to other patients. Uh, so, thank you. Thanks for sharing on that one. Um, let's think here. So Dr. Patel, from a scientific perspective, um, and we, we've been here, but possibly there's a little more to say. Um, what are you most excited about right now in your lymphoma research? Yeah, I think um, uh, there's a lot to pick from Jeff, but in particular, I would say, um, I talked about this, this type of immune therapy that we call cellular immunotherapy, where we actually take immune cells and modify them into um, cancer treatments, if you will. And the very first kind of uh, proof of that or iteration of that that perhaps people are familiar with are CAR T-cell therapies. Um, they've been um, now FDA approved for some years for some lymphomas. But the problem of those therapies is that they can have substantial side effects for some patients. So we need to continue to uh, innovate and move beyond that. So we now have in our uh, clinical trial uh, portfolio, really kind of the next generation of cellular immunotherapies. And these might be immune cells that um, are modified in ways where those side effects are much less common or perhaps not present at all. Um, and that means we're able to potentially apply these treatments to a much broader range of patients. So perhaps not only younger, fitter, healthier patients, but patients that might be older, might have other health problems where you know, the other uh, options uh, are, are typically very limited. So um, we have several of these trials in, in our portfolio now, and, and we'll call them you know, next generation uh, cellular immunotherapies. I love it, great, thank you for sharing. Uh, Tenzin, a uh, very similar question for you. Um, looking down the road, what gives you hope for the future of multiple, uh, excuse me, multiple myeloma care? Um, I, I would say the progress we have made, you know, um, I, we, we see it on the daily, but if you want to kind of put it on the, on the long-term kind of effect, you know, looking back, um, I think 25 years ago, the, the survival rate of a newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patient was three to five years, you know, and now we're looking at seven to 10 years. And it's not just seven to 10 years um, of, you know, like, as I mentioned earlier, being in a hospital and having all sorts of side effects, but, you know, with immunotherapies, we're, we're, we're hoping that, you know, you can maintain the lifestyle and, um, you know, have a good, good life while getting treated and the hope really for multiple myeloma is down the road. If we can kind of, 
you know, treat it as kind of a chronic disease for long term versus, um, you know, treating it as a, as a cancerous uh, for a shorter amount of time. So that would be the hope. Um, you know, also kind of just to touch base on what Dr. Patel has mentioned about the CAR T therapies and the cellular therapies. I think when I started five years ago, you know, we had lots of patients inquiring about a CAR T cell therapy for multiple myeloma. And at that point, uh, we didn't have anything available. Um, it was just this kind of this unicorn that, you know, people were reading about and hearing about, but it was not available. And, you know, we recently have had our our first uh, multiple myeloma CAR T cell therapy approved by the FDA. And uh, so, you know, that's all the progress that we have made. And, you know, there's so much further to go, but to, it's, it's exciting time because, you know, we, we see a gradual progress from one step to another. And, you know, on top of the CAR T cell therapies, we have the bispecific T cell engagers that you mentioned earlier that um, have shown uh, some pretty remarkable preliminary uh, results in efficacy in patients um, in multiple myeloma. So it's an exciting time to be in the, in the hematologic world right now with all the research that, that are going on. I love it. Thank you. I have to say, as I'm, I'm starting to wrap you know, my head around so much of what's been said and, and filter it is, we think about Dr. Patel. You mentioned, you know, the the, the trajectory of research can sometimes actually you both have that it can be slow and sometimes a little frustrating, as Tenson said earlier. That's just the nature of it. Um, and so often when we think about, uh, you know, curing a disease or managing a disease, we're thinking next generation, future generations will get to benefit from this. And absolutely, that is the case. But what I've just heard you both say is it's also happening like in real time. I mean, it's happening in in patients lives right now. Um, so how incredible it must be for you as, as researchers and clinicians and folks um, who, are, who are dealing with it, these diseases to know um, that, you know, this stuff is happening as we speak. Um, so thanks for sharing all of that. Um, this would be a good time to see if we have questions. It looks like we do here, questions in the Q&A. And pardon me as I'm uh, still learning to do, to learn, learning to manage some of these pieces of technology. Um, so the first question is, and I'll just put this out there and I'll let you two arm wrestle for who gets to answer it. Uh, we're hearing more about compromised people getting a fourth COVID shot, uh, in timing of COVID or flu while undergoing, um, while under ongoing multiple myeloma treatment. Oh, I guess that was a question. Um, so I, I, let me, let me reword it. Possibly are there considerations uh, that folks who are undergoing multiple myeloma treatment should uh, keep in mind when thinking about their COVID vaccinations. Yeah, so Jeff, I, I'll first say this is really highlights sort of the importance of, of being engaged in clinical research because these are the kinds of questions we get answered every day in the clinic that we may not yet have answers for. Um, so this is one of those types of questions. And, um, you know, there are ongoing studies that we are uh, undertaking with um, the COVID research teams at Swedish, including the infectious disease teams, to try to better understand, um, you know, what 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 is the optimal way to immunize patients whose own immune systems are compromised by their cancer or their treatment. So um, I think you know there's not a direct answer to that, but highlights the importance of of um, how we do research and what these research questions are informed by, often by the questions we're facing in the clinic. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, the next question that's been posed is, I'm wondering if there are any helpful, hopeful treatments beyond chemotherapy and regular blood transfusions uh, on the horizon for older MDS patients who are not eligible for marrow transplantation due to advanced age, et cetera. And they close by saying, thank you. And then you wanna take this one, I, I know you, you uh know the what's in the pipeline pretty well. Yeah, so we actually did just open up. So MDS uh, you know, space has always been kind of an unmet need that we um, have been trying to get a trial onboarded here. And um, you know, recently- and Would you mind saying what MDS is for folks who may not know? Myelodysplastic syndrome. And it is Thank kind you. of the precursor to uh, acute uh, leukemia. So we want to be able to treat these patients early on to kind of not prevent, you know, progressing over to AML, but at least to kind of prolong that time 
um, and that's what MDS diagnosis is. Um, so, you know, we recently had actually two trials started here for um, MDS patient population who um, have either never been treated or we do have another study that does a kind of similar, but patients who have had at least one or two treatments for their MDS. So, um, but yeah, we, we do have treatment options available for patients who, who are not eligible for transplant uh, due to, you know, um, other circumstances or age or what it may be. Wonderful. So um, for the individual that asked that question, um, is there uh, any suggested next steps? Should they talk to their clinician? Absolutely. I, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, uh, correspond with you, whoever that may be. And uh, yeah, if, if you want to send me an email, I can get in touch with you and figure out what the next step might be. Great. Thank you. Um, I know that my contact information will be displayed at the end here. Um, I honestly can't remember uh, if it's just mine. So to the individual who asked that question, once you see that, do feel free to contact me and uh, we can help make that connection. All right. Thanks, Tenzin. Uh, and then another question. Uh, is sequencing only available in a trial or at, you know, or at end stage, um, or is it available earlier on, perhaps after a first or second relapse? Uh, is it available in multiple myeloma? Yeah, so Jeff, I think that question is asking about genomic sequencing, so trying to understand um, what uh, one's uh, DNA information might tell us or be able to help inform us about uh, not only treatment selection, but things like prognosis. Um, so I, I think, you know, I can answer that question in a number of ways. Um, this is an area where we really try to collaborate with other centers that um, to allow us to kind of quickly gather information about um, what this genetic information actually does or does not tell us. Mm -hmm. um, a good example of that is, um, you know, we, we uh, partner, there's a Providence-wide um, genomic uh, sequencing protocol that's run out of the Providence Cancer Center in uh, Portland. Um, that really leverages the expertise of the molecular um, and uh, genomic biologists that, that work in that um, research laboratory. So sequencing of any kind can be available to patients um, depending on the type of cancer in there that may be available within the context of a clinical trial. So you know that may be an area where we really don't know what that information tells us. We're trying to learn better the context to put it in or it could be available um, outside of a trial with what we would call you know, commercially available diagnostics. These are tests that have been validated and have been approved for that use by, by the FDA. Wonderful, thank you. Your answer hits so much of what this discussion has been about um, from you know, trials in the, or, or uh, the research leading to treatments, uh, the collaboration piece, uh, which is always so important and on and on. So uh, thanks for sharing that. So um, we are starting to wrap up our time together. Um, uh, well, and I was going to say, if there are further questions, please type them in now. And one just appeared. Um, for multiple myeloma, the new FDA approval approved T cell and other ongoing trials seem to require that a patient, the patients go through many other treatment, uh, treatment, treatments until options exhausted, and by the time the patient's health is not as strong. Our medical professionals now suggesting going straight to T cell therapy uh, as a medical first or main course of action. Sorry, I kind of butchered that question a little bit, but I think you got the gist of it. <laughs> okay, Jeff, I think we understood the, the gist of the question. You know, it, it's interesting that that question was raised, and whoever raised it, thank you for that. Um, uh, Dr. Patel and I actually, you know, this morning we were just discussing. Uh, a T cell therapy that could be given um, in a prior line therapy. So basically meaning when you are, you know, when you haven't exhausted everything and you are correct that um, a lot of the T cells that are approved right now, you know, require you, you to have failed at least three or four prior lines of therapy. And, you know, what we're trying to figure out in, in the research world is also to see if we can introduce these T cell therapies earlier on uh, instead of waiting in a later line of therapy you know, would the outcome be the same? Are the effects greater because we're trying to attack the disease at, a, at its initial, initial stages rather than, you know, at a later stage? So um, yes, the, the ones that are approved currently are probably for uh, later lines of therapy, but there are many clinical trials available that utilizes immunotherapy that are 
um, you know, uh, enrolling patients who have had only one prior line therapy or even some newly diagnosed, uh, you know, therapies that uh, could be eligible for CAR T cells. So Dr. Patel and I were just discussing that this morning and, you know, we're looking at bringing one of those trials here at SCI as well. Fantastic, thank you. Um, okay, well, um, as we're wrapping up, kind of a last call for questions. Um, and while that happens, um, Actually, oh, there is a question here. Can you comment on the initial the initial study on, um, I believe it's meant to be CAR T cells, and there's a reference to Europe. Yeah, so I think Jeff, I see the question they're asking about um, CAR natural killer cells. So natural killer cells are a different type of immune cell than a T cell. Um, you know that actually is. Um, so there are a number of different uh, early efforts to try to. Um, develop those types of therapies going on not only in Europe but in the U.S. In fact, we, we happen to have two clinical trials at Swedish using natural killer cell-based therapies to treat blood cancers. Um, we're actually the leading enroller on one of those two clinical trials. So, um, you know, what I can say is in general, using other types of immune cells may have benefits for some patients. Um, they may offer us less side effects um, than, say, uh, CAR T cells. Um, but I think it's still a very early time to be able to, to say a lot about those types of therapies. Um, we're really in those kinds of proof of principle stages as a community. And, and you know, certainly we've had positive outcomes in some of our patients treated on those types of trials. And, and we continue work to, to further develop them and hopefully understand kind of where they fit um, in, the, uh, in the arsenal um, for, for you know, varying types of blood cancers. Excellent, thank you. Um, and another question just came up uh, and um, I don't know the answer offhand. I don't know that either of you would. It's basically asking if one can get CME points for this event. Um, we will look into that and get back to you. I wrote your name down. Uh, so we will we'll be in touch, thank you. All right, so with that, as we're wrapping up, we're really just a couple minutes out. Um, I wanted to ask each of you if, if you had any concluding thoughts, anything you haven't touched on or covered uh, before we close. And again, no requirements because you've covered a lot of ground here. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Tenzin, you unmuted. <laughs> no, I mean, I just wanted to, you know, at closing, just say thank you to uh, all the, the, the participants and anybody attending this, um, you know, forum. Um, I think it kind of goes along with what I was mentioning earlier that, you know, hopefully this is educational. The more you know, the more you're open to kind of doing your own research and learning about it and uh, empowering yourself, um, whether you're a patient or a clinician, to just learn more about all of these uh, different aspects of what a treatment entails. So thank you for attending. Great. Well said. Thank you. Um, so as we wrap up, um, I'd also like to take a moment uh, to touch on something that, that came up a few times throughout here, and that's really to state how important philanthropy is to the work that our experts are doing. Um, it's so often, as we've heard, it so often serves of the, as the seed funding for projects um, that are based on these innovative new ideas uh, that may not, may not be ready for major funding sources such as the NIH or other uh, federal granting agencies. Um, I like to think of, think of it as the what if moment. Uh, so many of these, of what we've heard, these proven treatments started, at, all of them started as a what if moment. Um, and the research in many, many, many cases, the research that ultimately led to the pathway where, to where they are now, um, started through philanthropic funding. Um, to really get those those off the ground and, and moving and gathering the data they needed for proof of concept and so forth. Um, so it's really important that we acknowledge that and also say thank you to um, folks who are donors. Um, we really, really appreciate that. It's really critical. Um, if you want more information, uh, let me take a peek here. Okay, uh, my, contact in, my contact information and a link, uh, well, for support if you're interested, uh, will be shared right there. Um, so with that, I want to thank our Dr. Patel and Tenzin for joining us today. And as I said earlier, for everybody who joined this uh, gathering. And um, there is a brief survey that, survey that will be displayed when the call ends. If you have a moment, um, do please uh, let us know any feedback uh, that's good for us to hear. We're always looking to improve things like this. Um, and then again, if you have additional questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. My information um, is showing there. Um, so you can contact me. 
All right, well, with that, thank you, everybody, uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, please stay safe and healthy.